panentheism. A small seed planted into the social fabric of our species, an idea which only takes one Greek word to express, panentheism, and three English words to explain, pan, all, and in theism, God, all in God. And with that simple phrase, our species has the potential to change forever. Panentheism is the only understanding of reality rationally capable of resolving the debate regarding the validity of monism, the existence of only physical existence or dualism, the simultaneous existence of the physical aspect of the individual, and the spiritual existence of the individual. The Gift, Copyright. Any part of these works may be reproduced or utilized in any form or by any means. The formal copyright was obtained only to protect the source and the integrity of the work and to guarantee your access and authorization to freely use and reproduce this work. These concepts are not my own. They are the merging and logical conclusion to the blending of ideas created within a society supported and maintained by vast numbers of people, including you and those who came before you. A unified universal philosophy, otherwise known by Shepard as symbiotic panentheism. This particular narration has been extracted from the larger body of work entitled The War and Peace of a New Metaphysical Perception. The intent of the more than 20 plus tractates or books is to provide enough material to prove the validity of panentheism, not beyond all doubt, but to prove the validity of panentheism beyond all reasonable doubt. The point being to elevate the individual's and our species' perception of themselves in order to elevate human behavior on both an individual level and on a species level before we begin to step into, quote-unquote, the heavens. The series... Panentheism emerged from earlier metaphysical editions and have been edited and retitled to more accurately reflect the two true nature of their content. This is broken up into tractates in 28 volumes. Panentheism addressing humanity's purpose, volume 2, Panentheism addressing man made in the image of God, addressing science, religion, philosophy, and prophecy. Perhaps volume three is the most important tractate of this series, in my opinion. Volume four is a guide to volumes one through three. Volume 5, The Physical and the Non-Physical. Volume 6, Humanity Confined to a Universe. Volume 7, Free Will and Determinism. Volume 8, Anthropocentrism. 9, Theodicy. Volume 10, Addressing Universal Ethics. 11, The Lack of First Cause. Volume 12, addressing E equals MC squared. 13, the mathematics of non-members. 14, creation from the void. And this is what I'm reading from. 
addressing monism and dualism. 16. Addressing nihilism. 17. Language. 18. Philosophy's responsibility. 19. Addressing Occam's razor. 20. Addressing symbiotic panentheism. 21. Being the summit. 22. Do we need to change? Can we change? 23. Addressing Western philosophy. 24. Addressing chaos slash complexity. 25. Addressing abbreviated thoughts. 26. Addressing the whole of reality. 27. Addressing the soul. 28, and this is another important, addressing God slash Brahma, Brahma. So at this point, we are halfway through the tractate, uh, Panentheism, Addressing Monism and Dualism, Volume 15. At this particular point, we are about halfway through the material, so I will divide it up in, into approximate 30-minute sections until I finish or complete reading this particular material. Panentheism addressing monism and dualism. Continuing, the historical conflict expanded. Homogeneity does not apply to just world conflict as epitomized by the event of World War II, genocide, slavery, exclusionism, domination, all exemplify the concept of homogeneity. Perhaps one of the latest under, least understood forms of homogeneity or geneity lies in the form of slavery. Slavery is not an issue of color. Slavery is not an issue of simple physical enslavement of one person by another, but slavery reaches into the realm of psychological dependence, intimidation, addiction, stalking, etc. Slavery is an issue of monistic perception. Slavery, regardless of the color of the enslaved at first glance, may be perceived as a form of dualism, a we and they, or us versus them scenario. Slavery, however, is a monistic scenario for slavery like genocide aims at preserving the elite, the owner, as the viable entity. The purpose of the slave is to preserve the elite status of the quote-unquote master. The only reason the slave is allowed to exist by the owner is for the owner's personal status and level self-preservation. One of the most blatant forms of genocide emerging from the latter part of the second millennium was the desecration of the American Indians by the European colonists. The Native Americans were not sold into slavery by their own brothers, as was the case of the Africans, nor were the Native Americans forced into slavery, as was done by the European colonists to the Africans. The Native Americans were not needed for the self-preservation of the European colonials. The European colonials perceived themselves needing the natural resources in the land itself. The process of obtaining the perceived needed resources 
was the process of genocide. How often do we see this even repeated up till the present in our current uh, world circumstances? The means of rationalizing the morality regarding the genocide of the North American Indians lay in the metaphysical perception of monism. The monistic perception, in essence, allowed the European colonists to view the Native Americans as animals, heathens, and entities lacking souls. True, the Church viewed the Native Americans as having souls, but the Church perceived the souls of the American Indians to be predetermined to burn in hell unless they converted to Christianity. And of course, in many ways, this is being repeated over and over. Just pick your tradition and you can see it. Whether it be Judaism, Christianity, Islam, or other. Conversion, forced or otherwise, is of the necessity within that particular view of things. Although such a rationalization by the church appears to have been an acceptance of the concept of dualism, such a perception, in essence, was, is, not a form of dualism, but is rather a modified form of homogeneity, or monism. How can the religious perception of a soul existing separate from the body be a form of homogeneity, be a form of monism? It is not the church's concept of soul and body existing as separate entities, which is a form of homogeneity, but rather it is the church's perception that all souls must act, believe, rationalize in a specific fashion, which is the fundamental form of homogeneity, which we find within orthodox fundamentalist forms. Just pick your tradition. Religious homogeneity, or you could call exclusivism, is not unique to Christianity. Religious conformity is an expectation most major human religions impose upon their quote-unquote converts and attempt to impose upon their desired would-be converts. Although, most religious organizations refuse to grant the soul the independent status of uniqueness, rising to the level of equality one to another. The religious concepts, fundamentals, principles upon which the organizations are founded do set the foundation for such a principle. Philosophical monism views the soul as an innate characteristic of the physical, as an extension of the physical. Philosophical dualism views the soul, consciousness of consciousness, as a separate entity of the physical, which emerges not from the physical, but rather becomes aware of the physical through its own ability to sense the physical. The monists would say the physical may become attained consciousness, although the physical itself reaching a complexity capable of conscious action. Monists would declare such a state emerges as an innate characteristic of the physical and thus inseparable from the physical, a monistic state. 
The dualist would say approximately the same. However, the dualist would say there is an even more complex relationship which can occur. The physical can reach a level of development where consciousness of consciousness itself can occur. The dualist, however, would say that consciousness of the physical and the conscious ability to respond to stimuli within the physical are not the same as knowing consciousness of one's conscious action. Dualists would say the conscious knowing of one's conscious actions and desires generated by physical stimuli are together different concepts from conscious action. The second is physical and the first is non-physical, or as Zeno would say, abstractual. The disadvantage working against the dualist arguments before the Kant-Hegel model was established was that the preponderance of the observable, the measurable, and the preponderance of rationalization worked to support the monist position. Thus, the Aristotelians and the phenomenologists appeared to have the stronger argument. With the advent of Kant-Hegel arguments steeped in rationalization began to equalize the dualistic arguments with the monistic arguments. However, the observable and the measurable still leaned heavily towards the monists. The metaphysical understanding of the monist-dualist debate remained intensely ambiguous. Again and again, war erupted between those striving to develop their personal forms of homogeneous purity for our species and those wishing to preserve the uniqueness of individual diversity. Once again, the conflict arises between the one and the many. The sins of the father in regards to the son. Perhaps the most insidious perceptual effect generated by the monist position is the perception that future generations must shoulder the burden regarding rectifying the atrocities of previous generations. The monist approach regarding Homogeneity shackles future generations to the past rather than frees their energies for improving the future. The sins of the father, so-called, attitude keeps the generations operating in the present from concentrating upon changing the future since most of their efforts must be concentrated upon rectifying the past. I often say you can't move forward if you're living in the past. But aren't individual souls, individual entities, obligated to correct the actions of past generations? The monist point of view would suggest the sins of the father are to be borne by the future generations, because the offspring are in fact nothing other than innate products of the father's loin and the mother's womb. The shame of the Nazi genocide machine, the attempt to suppress the history of, of Area 731, the desire to suppress the American Indian tragedy, the atrocities of the Crusades, the American genocide, the exploitation of humanity by humanity, ad infinitum, become our closeted secrets examined only when there is no other choice but to do so. Rather than learn from the past, we hide from the past because we are afraid 
We are responsible for the past. Monastically, we perceive ourselves as physically tied to the past and thus responsible for the past. The contemporary dualist point of view is very similar to the monist's point of view regarding responsibility for the quote-unquote sins of the father to be revisited in generations forward. For contemporary dualists are not true dualists. Contemporary dualists believe we are responsible to make restitution for the past for just as they perceive the parent and society to be responsible for the past. These proclaimed dualists perceive we must provide restitution for the past, pay for our father's sins. Contemporary dualists perceive our father's sins to be our sins. Neither the contemporary monists nor the contemporary dualists are capable of letting go of such concepts. Within the metaphysical perception of the individual acting within God or spirit or the abstraction, we are neither monistically or nor dualistically responsible for the actions of our fathers, for we are separate entities from our fathers, and as such, we are responsible for our personal actions and lack of actions. Sociologically, sociologically, the monistic and dualistic debate comes down to who owns the body? Does society own the body? Does the entity of singularity, individuality, the knowing element of the whole of knowing own the body? Does the entity of singularity, summation of multiplicity, the whole itself own the body? In essence, does the body belong to the individual or does the body belong to the whole? This reminds me of a specific verse in 1 Corinthians chapter 6. You are not your own. You were bought at a price. Therefore glorify God in your body in so many words. The answer to such a question in more generic terms establishes the concept. Does homogeneity or diversity win the war humankind has been conducting since written history began to record humanity's actions? Some professed monists and professed dualists would suggest the whole owns the body, has the right to tell the individual what and how to treat their bodies. For the monist, the whole may be labeled with names such as the government, the judicial system, the IRS, the church, the teacher, the preacher, the police person, the priest, the Supreme Court. Some professed dualists and professed monists would suggest the individual owns the body, has the right to tell itself how to treat their personal body. The monist and the dualist are intertwined in a chaotic debate filled with contradictory positions, inundating the ranks of both because the monist and the dualist are fundamentally both right and fundamentally both wrong in their perceptions of reality. Where is the monist wrong and where is the dualist wrong in their perceptions? The monist and the dualist are both wrong in their perception as to where it is the conflict between them actually lies. 
the conflict between the monist positions and the dualistic positions lie not in the reality of closed Cartesianism, lies not in the physical as defined by contemporary philosophy, but rather the conflict lies in the in the open non-Cartesianism aspect of the new metaphysical model of reality, which is symbiotic panentheism. Where then are the monist and the dualist correct? The monist and the dualist are both correct in sensing they, monistic perceptions and dualistic perceptions, have their own unique and valuable contribution to make to the system or the whole. They are both monist and dualist correct in sensing that their positions are what makes the system what it is. In short, the system cannot be what the system is in terms of the new metaphysical perception of the individual acting within God or the abstract or spirit without the simultaneous existence of both the monistic perceptions and the dualistic perceptions. The dualism lies not in the knowing of the individual lying separate from the physical, but rather dualism lies in the knowing of the individual existing in its separateness from the whole itself. In short, multiplicity of individuality, multiple existences of unique entities of individuality comprising the whole must exist for the whole to have its own distinct individuality from its sub-elements. And I would say this makes the distinction between the causative force, the creator, and the created or creation. Monism, on the other hand, lies not in the knowing being an innate development of the physical, but rather monism exists in the knowing of the individual the individual being an essential part of the knowing of the whole, for without any of the individual entities of knowing, the whole of knowing could not be what it is. The whole of the knowing of knowing, in short, the sub-elements of the whole are innate characteristics of the whole of knowing itself, or awareness, or consciousness itself. Spirit the abstract, or what religions call God. Now at this juncture, I want to make a distinction, and it's important because I have brought up the concept of non-dualism. Non-dualism and monism are similar yet different in their perspectives. And I would add that non-dualism also perhaps solves the paradox between the dualist and the monist perceptions in a more effective manner. Showing the differences between monism and non-dualism, here's an AI overview. Non-dualism and monism are both philosophical theories that offer or uh, differ rather in their approach to the relationship between the one and the many. I would say non-dualism is perhaps more reconciling because it doesn't dissolve the many into the one so that the diversity is extinguished but rather accepts and creates the distinction and upholds the distinction between the creator, the source, the causative force, God, spirit, the abstract, the transcendent, from the imminent or the created, the contingent, the physical.
but yet unites them as one as monism seems to attempt by merging all things into one substance so non-dualism is the idea that the world is not made up of separate elements but rather that there is unity in diversity something perhaps that monism in and of itself falls short of non-dualism is a way of being in the world where one feels connected to everything around them in other words unity of consciousness christ consciousness cosmic consciousness enlightenment non-dual awareness and so on the term comes from sanskrit where advita becomes not to or where it means not to where in God the two become one. The idea that reality is based on a single substance or principle is monism, and that all things are manifestations of that one reality. And in a sense this is true as well, but it's limiting. Monists believe that the one is before its parts and that the cosmos is fundamental for example a circle is before the two semicircles that make it up some examples of monism include the ideas and heraclides the stoics and plato some examples of non-dualism within religions and I would add Christianity to this as well. For there are forms of non-dualism within at least the five major religions that I can think of. So non-dualism is included in Advaita Vedanta and Zen Buddhism as well. Non-dualism emphasizes unity amid diversity. It does not seek to obliterate diversity into a oneness position. In contrast, monism posits that reality is ultimately grounded in a singular substance or principle. And it is not altogether incorrect, it just falls short. And non-dualism seems to pick up where it cannot. And monism reduces the multiplicity of existence to a singular foundation. The distinction lies in their approach to the relationship between the many and the one. And with that AI overview of the difference between monism and non-dualism, similar yet different in their approach to the relationship between the one and the many. That said also, thank you for listening to be continued.